What's going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube and aren't subscribed, make sure and click the subscribe button, like, comment, let us know what you think about the episode. If there's a particular guest or topic that you'd like to have on, we'd love to be able to hear your suggestions and, and read your comments and then be able to get the topics you want onto the podcast. And today I'm really excited. I saw that Dynamite Diesel Products is working on some really cool P-Pop upgrades. I thought it'd be great to sit down with Lenny Reed from Dynamite Diesel Products have him give us like a, a P pump 101. Take us from the beginning stages through upgrades we may want all the way to you know, crazy power levels. So they got some cool products. He's going to walk us through that. Definitely look forward to learning from him today. Before we get to it though, I want to remind you our friends over at Kershaw Knives have a 40% off MSRP code for you. If you go to kershaw.kaiusa.com, use code 2024diesel40, get 40% off MSRP. You got a whole lineup of really cool knives. If you need something for hunting, fishing, EDC, around the job site, they've definitely got you covered. We appreciate them offering this code for you guys. So if you're in the market, use that discount code and save some money on some really cool gear. All right, let's get to today's podcast with Lenny Reed from Dynamite Diesel Products and going through P pumps. Lenny, welcome back to the Diesel Podcast. I, uh, gosh, I had a great time chatting with you in December. We covered a lot of cool topics, and I wanted to catch up with you on some of them and then jump into P pump stuff. But welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, thank you. It's good to be back. Did you have a good holiday? Uh, man, holidays this year were kind of nice. Yeah, it was fun, and we were a little bit light on snow here, which is kind of a bummer all the time because Christmas in my world should always have snow because Santa's sleigh tears <laughs> up the asphalt shingles. If you have on your house without snow. So, yeah. I like it when it's snowy. <laughs> for, um, for any listeners who didn't catch our podcast in December, I definitely go back and check it out. One of the, the huge things we chatted about was the Patriot series line of injectors. And I've had some questions filter in after that episode, people asking questions about it. How's that been going? Cause you guys launched it not too long ago. Yeah, so the Patriot series is just our in-house remand stuff. And uh, I mean, there's growing pains, obviously. Uh, the tool that we bought was supposed to be like certified, ready to rock. All the things were going to be amazing and life was going to be great. And then uh, unfortunately, the tool that we bought is getting used more in this building than any other client that this manufacturer has. So now they... It's got some uh, bugs that they're having to work out. It's kind of it's kind of chinky. Like it's just it, the the chain of command isn't very smooth in the machine, and uh, it, it does consume more time than it's supposed to. So because of that, uh, we decided that we would do the Association of Diesel Specialists show this year. So we're actually leaving. I leave Sunday. Uh, Wade Boyd will be there with the booth and the pickup. Um, I fly in with Brian Bailey and the three of us will kind of work the show, meaning two of us will be in the booth at all the times. And one of us will be out shaking hands, kissing babies. And, and I will be looking at new brands of tools for what we're doing. So it's, we're, we're currently doing about 40 of those per day. And of course, you know, like that's beginning stages. Um, so we're having, we, we still, it needs to be up closer to a hundred a day. And uh, to facilitate that, we finally got uh, our second EDM. So now we have three EDM heads pushing wire instead of just one. So we'll at least double the output of what we were able to EDM from before without having to run a second shift. Uh, and we've never, we've never ran a second shift in Dynamite's history. So I'd kind of like to just optimize every minute from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. before we do that. So it's pretty exciting. And then uh, with that, we've, you know, other growing pains is the solenoid manufacturer that we're using. First batch was like a thousand pieces and had zero warranties. Second batch was like 600 pieces and we had like half dozen warranties. Uh, and they did some really, really, really strange, very hard to troubleshoot stuff, but every one of them failed either in the test stand or within the first five seconds of startup in the truck. So we got through that, figured out what they did with the solenoids to make them incorrectly, moved on from that, and things have been pretty smooth. Control valves and nozzles, 100% perfect. We've had zero failures on either one of those parts as of yet. So out of several thousand parts that we've made now, 
Um, warranty rate's been pretty dang low, so we're we're kind of stoked. But I know yeah. people people were excited about it with the the quality, the information, the knowledge they have from you, and then the pricing. And for those trucks that aren't looking for big power or anything like that, they just need the trucks to run. They need them to be reliable. Need them to go point A to point B. It's a it's a, it's a really great option. So I wanted to kind of catch up with you on that because people, you know, they say, Hey, when you get Lenny back on, ask him about the Patriot series or, you know, different things like that. So I like to keep them updated. It, you know, it's uh it's basically when the guys upstairs build the Patriot style injector and they put it on the shelf. So the guys downstairs in dynamite land can grab that injector. It's not been lasered. It's not been marked up yet. So it's basically a stock injector ready to roll. When, when Dynamite's employees grab it, they're now grabbing something that's going to be very easy to calibrate as an Eco or a 50 or a 90 or a 120, 200, so on and so forth. So it makes the guys downstairs jobs, you know, theoretically easier because if it's tighter calibrated right out of the, you know, stock form, then building it as a bigger injector calibrates even easier. So and and like I say, there's been some growing pains with that, but that's that's the goal right there is when Dynamite's employees can go through a bunch more sets every day because there's a, a loss, a, a smaller loss in time, wasted time trying to calibrate. Uh, and, you know, like I say, we, we pretty much ran out of capacity on the EDM. So I ordered the second EDM, gosh, two years ago. And uh, that second EDM is in the building right now. It's awesome. That thing's going to be so cool. Comes its own chiller. This thing has two heads on it to burn wire in the same cycle time. So it's for our pilot hole technology. This thing was built and designed so the operator of the EDM can drop a nozzle on the EDM and run the primary pattern. And then when it's done running primary, it scoots over about one inch. And right now I'll have green screen guys send you a picture on the green screen of what the heads look like paired up side by side so it moves over about an inch and then it goes in and attacks the nozzle with the second piece of wire so the edm operator only has to touch the nozzle one time and it comes out with two different size holes and in the future when you have an elliptical style pattern um, the holes when you place a hole towards the very very tip like closest to the piston when the needle valve comes off of seat and it starts to flow fuel, the the holes that are closest to the tip see fuel first and they see fuel the hardest. So when you're in a 7.3 liter power stroke or a 5.9 Cummins, since the uh, pattern isn't just on the same plane going around, so green screen show me that. Now green screen show me elliptical pattern. Now elliptical pattern is kind of tilted so that way as the injector is firing in the bowl at an angle it's able to get to the shoulders of the bowl at the same distance but it's not the most efficient when you make all of the spray holes the exact same size so it's never been a problem but the hydraulic theory is the holes that are further away from the piston actually need to be a little bit bigger in order to flow the exact same volume of diesel as the one closest to the piston. So here this year, like, you know, we've got a lot of things moving here. We've got the new pump, we've got these injectors, but we need to start testing with two different size wires in a five hole pattern, just to make sure that we are getting the exact same penetration. Uh, and then we were just at the PRI show recently and I had a fellow from a college, which I'm not going to name yet, but a university approached us and asked, told us what they had for tools and things like that, asked us if we would be interested in coming out and participating in some experiments at the university. And uh, because they've got like uh, basically a controlled explosion chamber that simulates uh, combustion chambers. So I opted for that very, very quickly. That's going to be very exciting. I'm very cool. They're in May. So it's, I mean, trying to, you know, this business is all about like who your friends are. Cause not everybody has all of the money for all of the NASA style tools that it takes to do this job. So man, just trying to be relevant, trying to be awesome, trying to, uh, trying to do things not everybody else is doing. 
you wonder if anybody understands or is paying attention, but I keep getting little examples thrown at me that show me that people are paying attention. So it's a, it's a pretty flattering feeling these days. It's pretty yeah, cool. That's, that's going to be fun. One of the things that uh, goes hand in hand with injectors is injection pumps. And <clears throat> I, I saw some posts from you guys on the dynamite diesel um, Instagram a page of some P-pump stuff you're working on. And I had the idea because we never really jumped into P-pumps. We've covered a few things before, like governor springs, delivery valves, stuff like that, but never the whole pump. And I thought it would be great to have a conversation from basically beginner to more advanced about P-pumps and specifically what you're doing uh, with them. One of the huge things that jumped out to me when I was on uh, the Dynamite Diesel website was the pump that you have covering power from 350 horsepower to 1,350 horsepower. And it was so it was so cool to me because a lot of times as a diesel truck owner enthusiast, you have to make choices. You have to decide, do I want 600 horsepower? Do I want 800? Do I want 400? And then you have to pick these parts kind of with that in mind. And so you almost kind of get boxed in or you have to definitely know exactly what you want. So I thought that wide range was really cool. Um, so I want to have you chat with us a bit about P pumps and then what you're doing with them. So working on ultra high end, like say a three inch, you know, PPL sled puller with no nitrous, the efficiency of the engine has to be a hundred percent to be at the top of that game because of, you know, so many customers that we have that are, you know, every single weekend this year, we were on the podium. I mean, if there was three spots on the podium, we were at least two spots on the podium at almost every single truck pull this year. And that is something to be super proud of because all of those guys, you know, whether it's any of our camps that we support, they all have their different recipes and they don't, we make them injectors specifically for them, but every one of them is doing things a little bit different. So I've learned a little bit about mechanical injection based off of what I've learned in common rail. And those guys are all right with each other. Horsepower wise, like they're all pretty close within 30 or 40 horse. Uh, and that's probably more, you know, the fact that they're not even dynamic in the same state. So they're, they're all building super solid power plants. Um, one thing we've learned with them is pressure at the nozzle is key like everybody talks about rail pressure in common rails but nobody really understands that it's not rail pressure we're after it's actually nozzle pressure an example of that would be on a common rail if i put a 400 percent nozzle on a stock body it is a hot smoky mess that pumps way less volume than if we put a hundred percent nozzle on the same body so we learned a few tricks there we've also learned that injector on time or the duration which the injector is spraying that is something that is very, very uh, key to exhaust gas temperature management. So we've got customers out there that are pulling in PPL. Bear in mind, there's no water in three inch and there's no nitrous. So it's just whatever you're limited on air. So three inch inducer, there's a couple of turbo guys out there, you know, hearts is at the top of that game. And if you've got a hearts charger, three inch, you're going to be somewhere next to that 1600 horsepower uh, at the uh, flywheel. And there's guys that are super smoky and super dirty that make 1,450, 1,500 horsepower. And now we've got guys that are 16, 16 and change that are basically like EPA certified going out the stack. It's pretty cool. So nozzle pressure is a big, big thing. And injector on time timing, you know, when you can grab a laptop and set timing where you want it to manage exhaust gas temperature and still give you really good spool ability off the bottom. So something that you watch in sled pulling would be a guy sets his timing to 38 degrees static with a flat top plunger in a P7100. You start the truck on a can of ether. And if it's like 45 degrees, you start the truck on two cans of ether. And once it's kind of warm and they've got some heat in the block, it'll start, it'll pull up to the sled and the big boys will start, and it's kind of blah, 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 cough, cough, eh, gross. And it's wet stacking. It's not burning all the fuel because the injection timing is so far advanced, and it needs to be revved up 
But in order to get revved up, it has to find its way to get there and be happy. My thought was if we if we followed what what other manufacturers have done in P pump technology that nobody really caught on to, but we made our own plunger with our own diameter, then I bet we could really be. I really enjoy the Bosch P pump 215 style plunger, but at wide open throttle in our testing, we got that thing to pump 550 cc's, which is really good, but it's not great. And then if we go to, that's got a notch top, it's got adjustable timing. And if we go from that plunger up to the Bosch 13 mil, uh, it's a flat top. So it's static timing. You set it and you forget it. It is, if you set it at 26 degrees, it's 26 degrees all the way through the power curve. That thing will jump to 750 cc's, which to make big power, you really need fuel like that. The part that I hated about the 13 mil plunger was it's a flat top. So there's no adjustable timing as you rev it up. And number two was the fact that the idle quantity, so at like 13 millimeters of rack, which is very shallow rack travel, uh, with a, a 215 style plunger, you're going to pump around 210 cc's. And that was in our testing as well with a number eight plate, you know, trying to do this pretty well certified. So any shop out there could kind of fact check us per se. But when you use a 13 mil plunger, you go from like 210 to 450 cc's. That is such a drastic jump that when you try and drive a 13 mil truck on the street, every time you wiggle in the seat and your foot brushes the gas pedal, it's like 100 horsepower worth of fuel. So it makes it not very comfortable to try and drive on the street and they're super smoky and they're hard, they're, they're just hard to modulate. So it's it's never been really street popular. And yeah. if you're going to build something, you really got to build it for the street trucks because, well, that's where the mass is. That's where the number is. Um, so my dream was to make something in the middle, though, not a 12, not a 13, a 12 and a half. So I made the 12 and a half DLC coded plungers. And we then, what we learned with that was I had Kevin at Northeast, you know, give me all these numbers. So it wasn't just Lenny's, you know, up in smoke, like opinion uh, but kevin came up with you know this a stock 215 style plunger 210 cc's at 13 and a half the 13 mil plunger 450 cc's and our 12 and a half is 310 cc's why is that cool well because a lot of guys that own p-pump trucks when they go from a stock injector to anything bigger the first thing they notice is it doesn't want to start and it doesn't want to idle as good as it used to. Now I want to backtrack and I want to mention something, nozzle pressure. You don't have enough volume at idle with your little 12 millimeter pump. So you can trick it by loosening up the governor springs and then increasing the idle travel. And that will give you more fuel and that'll overcome that problem. Number two, you can go from like a 181 or a 191 up to a 024 delivery valve. And that will hit the injector harder, and that will overcome some of that as well. So when you've got a truck that's never been benched by a really good professional that knows what he's doing, then those are the first complaints that guys with bigger injectors ever give you is it doesn't start as good and it doesn't idle near as strong as it used to. Well, that's why. With the 12 and a half mil plunger, it's not only they're all getting benched by somebody that knows what time it is, uh, but it's also got a larger plunger foot, so it's going to pump more idle. And then when you start breathing on the gas pedal, it wants to make line pressure. It wants to make nozzle pressure very, very quickly. So it's going to be a very responsive yet very controllable pump and uh, not like the 13, but a wide open throttle where the, the 12 millimeter plunger was giving us 550 cc's. The 13 mil gave us 750, which is great. Our 12.5 gives us 700 cc's. So we're 50 cc's short of the 13, but we add eight degrees timing engine at wide open throttle. So we're limiting the rack travel at 19.5 millimeters in this pump using our fuel plate. So if you buy a, a very set of a, a small set of injectors like Ecos and pull the fuel plate back. It'll be a very responsive, very amazing mileage, super crispy driving, smoke-free 350 horsepower. You give it just a little bit of fuel plate, start sliding it forward, 
and that's going to allow the rack to travel. And you're going to start gaining uh, rack travel, which means you're going to gain at 15 degree, uh, 15 millimeters of rack, you're going to gain two degrees engine timing, and you're going to continue gaining two degrees all the way up to 19 and a half millimeters of rack. So it's basically about eight to 10 engine degrees is what we're gaining from idle to wide open throttle. So now you've got the added bonus of anybody who's ever tried to go on a flat top plunger from say 13 degrees to 20 degrees, audibly you hear a much noisier engine. And 20 is kind of manageable. Like you can go through most parking lots without annoying everybody. But when you pull into the drive through you still got to shut the truck off. Like nobody hears you. Now, with this pump, we're going to set them all. We're going to pin time at 18 because that's pretty quiet. But bear in mind, at wide open throttle, we're still going to gain 8 to 10 degrees engine timing. So at wide open, if you're going to use all the plate travel, then that thing's going to make... 26 to 28 degrees engine timing which is a lot on a laptop when you can gain 10 degrees that's pretty cool so it's a game changer and it's something that you know only we have those plungers and as of right now kevin's the only people they're the only guy that's installed any of them so we've already sold one of the pumps i'm waiting to hear feedback from that guy uh he bought a set of stage fours I didn't really have anything engine wise that was capable of testing this thing. So we just are this morning today bolting turbos and fuel system on my truck that I call Blue Baller. So it's my 97, like 31,000 mile old truck. We built a 6.7 liter crank, got some Waggler rods that are 80,000 shorter. We use the 91 non intercooled piston because the bowl diameter is a bit bigger. And a bunch of my customers attacked me and told me I was crazy if I didn't try and use those. <laughs> so, um, you know, social media is a blessing. Uh, so I bought new pistons, did all the machine work, got, you know, used the torque plate when we built it. Um, it's got ARP 625s in it. It's got ARP hardware holding the, the connecting rods on. And this was a 14 mil block. So my main caps will be just fine. And it is still a cast piston motor. Uh, so we're targeting... SXE 76 blowing into a 363. I'm targeting like, I'd be stoked if it makes 750 at smoke free. And if it makes anything more than that, I'll be super stoked. But uh, this is our step one testing. And then we're going to build a deck plate 6.7 with a big head, uh, two valve head. And basically, we're going to put that in our C7 truck. That is going to be more of a 2,000, 2,200 horsepower goal. So that's, you know, like we, I feel like we've proven ourselves in common rail well enough that this year it's time to to rekindle the old flame for the P-Pump guys. So those are going to be our projects that we focus on is 750 street horsepower cast pistons. And then we're going to stand on the throat of a diamond piston deck plate, bad mama jamma, just to be like, oh yeah, like, because I don't know, like when we said 350 to 1350 mathematically and that many CCs, that's a pretty conservative number. So we're going to find out how much horsepower this, this 12 and a half mil pump will really make. But we also had made 14 millimeter plungers and those aren't going to be street worthy. They're way too, they at 13 and a half millimeters a rack, a stock 215 plunger is 210 CCs. The 12 is 300 CCs. A 13 is 450 cc's. The 14 is 650 cc's. So very much not street worthy, but there's still a lot of mechanically injected guys that are trying to go sled pulling and they needed something. The 15 mil plunger, there's so much hydraulic load when that plunger comes up that those guys complain that the 15 makes less power than a 14. So I figured, you know, we'll make our own 14 DLC code it, have it made in a factory where clearances can be set correctly. And uh, so far, results have been pretty good on those as well. So we're, we're super stoked about that. But those things are going to be buck wild. That's 1,050 cc's with a Bosch number eight plate being tested. So that's a very restrictive test on that plunger. Very restrictive. <laughs> yeah, I saw pictures of, the, of your blue 12 valve and it being under the knife and and I thought that would be a really cool truck to to test this out on because there's a there's a lot of people that are interested in that like four to six hundred horsepower mechanical truck, 
And that was one of the things I always remembered about it is there really wasn't a middle ground. It was either relatively mild, something you <clears throat> daily drive tow with, or you were going crazy with power. You didn't kind of have that yeah. middle ground. And this really bridges that gap really well. It, it does. And, you know, like I keep talking about friends that I've got that, you know, kind of help me. And the last time we talked about this, we talked about like, you know, back in the old day, I was going plungers, like 13 mil plungers. And then uh, I've got a, a buddy named Pat, who's got a very successful shop in Australia. He calls me up and he's like, Lenny, yeah, you weren't exactly right. And I'm like, what do you mean, Pat? And he says, well, if you look at those plungers that stick, it's actually like side loading that sticks those. So there's other things that can be done to the plunger to make that side loading alleviate itself. And I'm not going to like uh, throw his recommendations out there for everybody else to follow, but he's given me some pretty good ideas on things that we need to start trying. Um, DLC coating has eliminated the stiction problems that we've always had with the plungers. But as things progress forward, um, if these 14s start to stick, then now I've got another trick that we need to try. And uh, it's a machining trick, so we'll try that. I doubt that he's incorrect. I'm pretty sure he is correct because after he told me what he told me, then I started looking into books and things and realized what he was talking about. So that was, man, it, just having the right friends is <laughs> a big deal because we're trying things. And sometimes guys do that. Sometimes guys are in different marketplaces and they learn a lot about stuff that we don't learn in pickup truck land. So yeah. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate you. <laughs> he also did tell me one other thing that I had no idea because I've always said like static timing is static timing. And he calls me up one day and he goes, no, 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 you're actually not correct. And I thought, what? And he says, well, basically for every thousand RPM you go up, um, you're going to gain about one engine degree of timing, but it's such a minute amount that you would never be able to see it any other way than measuring exhaust gas pulse. And I thought, that's really technical. <laughs> and then if you read enough, you can actually find that there's there's actually clinical science that supports that. So for guys out there that have flat top pumps, you're actually not setting a static. As you rev it up, you do gain some timing. And I'm thinking that's that's based on the fact that every time you hit the injector line, as RPM goes up, you're hitting the injector line so frequently at that point that you're not relieving all the pressure out of the injection line. So you're kind of stacking fuel and it's, it's in stage sooner, sooner, sooner is how I kind of relate that in my own head. But yeah. So yeah, a lot of people out there, a lot of people. <laughs> well, one of the other, really, one of the other, um, you, you had mentioned before about the masses and where the mass of truck owners are. How much of a difference will this make for somebody who's in like that 350, 400 horse mark and then they want to go to five, 600, something like that. Maybe they, they want to take it that far. I really want to understand just what this gives because I've never, I've never owned a P-Pump truck. I, I've seen them. I've, I've had friends with them. I've never personally owned one and just been, you know, elbows deep in one of them. So I'm trying to understand how revolutionary it is from an owner's I, perspective. I love the question because now you're trying to get down to like, if I spend the money once, how far will the money go before yeah. I run out of potential? Exactly. In common rails, you get a, a stock injector to make 600 horsepower and that's stretched all the way out. That's, that's 3000 microseconds, super dirty, super hot, super smoky. And then you put like, say, a set of 50s in there and you can back off the pulse width by 500, 600 US, make the same power and it runs cooler and it's cleaner. And then if you stretch its legs out, it makes quite a bit more than the factory injector would have. So I would liken this to be a bit like having, having a really rowdy pump with a set of stage ones and the fuel plate pulled all the way back. You know, if you can get that to make 350 horsepower, and you've got, say, uh, one of them aggressor 6064s or a fleece cheetah, uh, and you've got enough turbocharger for, say, 400 horsepower, you just slide the plate forward just a little tiny bit, 
and there's your four hundred horsepower. And if you measure your, your drive pressure and you measure your boost pressure and, and things are still in balance, you slide the plate just a little bit further and now you're 500, 600 horsepower and it's still going to be ultra clean because you're using such a small injector and you're just punching it in the face with so much volume and it's increasing line pressure. So let's say you slide the plate all the way forward with our pump that's still limiting you at 19 and a half millimeters of rack where some of the guys will run them clear out to 21. We don't want you to do that. And there's reasons behind that. So my pump, as long as you use my plate, is never going to be as hot and smoky as your pump at home with a zero plate and a chopped off AFC foot. It just won't, it'll never be that dirty, that smoky. And I want it that way because the world hates smoke. They don't hate horsepower. They don't know how much horsepower you have, but they hate smoke. So I'm really trying to like, shape everybody's brain into thinking like my truck runs really good, but it's also less offensive than other people's trucks. They don't need to know your business. They don't need to know what's under the hood. And they certainly can, your truck might be 300 horsepower, but if it smokes, like it's a super stock, you're, you're not doing any of us in the diesel industry, any favors whatsoever. And it's really hard on your parts. Like you're flooding your crankcase with unburned diesel you're wasting money in it, you know, 350 to 550 a gallon. Like that doesn't seem like a good financial investment. That's the 50 year old me talking right there. <laughs> but if you, you know, say I'm the setup that I took out to the shop for Mitch to put in was set of stage fours and our 12 and a half mil pump. And when we put it on the dyno, first I'm going to go break the motor in because if you have a brand new motor and you go pouring the beans right to it, cylinder pressure gets to be so high on a non-seated ring that the cylinder pressure wants to blow by the non-seated ring and then it torches the hole inside the piston. So step one is we're going to go break the motor in, you know, lots of revving it up and revving it down, revving it up, revving it down with the plate pulled, you know, all the way back, not trying to like break it. Once we know that our crankcase ventilation is very limited, once we know that we've got sing rings that are seated, then we'll get it on the dyno and we'll start playing with the plate and we'll get it slid forward and like I said, they're pin time to 18 degrees engine. So if we have to move timing, then we will. But I highly doubt we will. So pretty soon, if I discover that a set of stage fours makes wants to make a thousand horsepower really quickly, then I'll pop a set of threes in it. And on our website, we will start giving recommendations like this pump. If you got this much air, run this injector because I really want guys to be able to use the smallest injector possible to achieve the goal that they're after. That way they can use as much throttle pump uh, throttle and try and move the rack so they can use all of the degrees of engine timing advance possible. So if you put, let's just say I put a great big set of customs in it and I could make a thousand horsepower with a fuel at half throttle. Well, if that's the, the case, then I'm not going to use, I'm not going to get to enjoy the eight degrees advance. So I want to use that. That helps manage exhaust gas temperature by a lot. So I'm, the goal here is to make the smallest injector party as hard as you can so you can enjoy all the degrees of advance as possible. Are there any, are there any downsides to running that smaller injector and working it harder? Because I, I think not necessarily with 12 valve stuff, but I've heard that question come up from people before. Is it better to push a smaller injector harder or pull back a bigger injector. <laughs> I've never, I've never torn apart an injector and said, wow, this one got overworked. <laughs> it's never been something that anybody in my injector shops ever said. So it's always better, always better to run the smallest injection orifice possible to do the amount of work that you're setting out to do. That's, and it frustrates me because, you know, guys on internet forums or whatever, they'll be like, man, I, I, I want to tow and I want to set up my truck for, you know, the occasional, you know, maybe, a, you know, kind of a pull out in front of somebody or drag race somebody on the street. And I'm like, all right, what my, my first question is always, how much power are you after? Well, I don't really know. I just told you, man, I want to tow and I want to be able to be like, you know, pretty quick on the street. What do you have for turbocharger? Well, I mean, it's stock right now. Okay, so you want 350 horsepower. Like, if you're trying to beat up a stock turbo, it's 350 horsepower. No, 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 man. I'm going to need more than that. Again, sir, what's the goal? 
if the goal is 500, then let's start with getting a turbocharger that will support it and then adding the fueling mods to get there. It's always, you know, like Gail Banks has never gone to a race in his life without knowing exactly how much horsepower he took. And every single time that guy's ever gone anywhere, whether it's Bonneville or the drag strip, that guy knew what the goal needed to be. If he needed 800, he didn't take 1500 because the more potential you have for horsepower, the more potential you have for busted parts. So if it takes 800 horsepower to win a race, Gail shows up with like 801. I respect the heck out of that because he's always, he's done a lot of ass kicking on the planet in a lot of different arenas of life, not just diesel, but he's always looked at it like I need, I need this much power. So I need that much airflow. I need this much boost. I need that much fuel. And he goes and does it. And his trucks have always run pretty clean and been pretty nice, you know, to, to watch um, and fairly reliable as well. You know, like there's a lot of other guys that, you know, me included, like, let's give all of the fuel, let's give all the boost, and then boom, when it blows up, you can't even figure out where it started to blow up because everything's gone. I mean, I've broken blocks and camshafts and connecting rods, pistons, and valves all in the same blow up. How do you troubleshoot that? What failed? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, I, uh, man, I, everybody should always think like, I, I want X amount of power and then buy the appropriate amount of parts to get you X amount of power. Like if you, if you're buying push rods and valve springs, but you still have a stock turbocharger, then you, you got suckered. Somebody talked you into some stuff that you didn't need yet. Cause you don't have enough air to support the kind of RPM to overcome the valve spring or the push rod. And personally, I would rather bend a push rod than anything upstairs. Um, I don't want the push rod to be so rigid that the valve uh, get shoved into the piston. I would rather, and the piston get hurt. I'd rather the the push rod turns into a piece of licorice and is my fusible link because those are pretty cheap, pretty easy to replace. So yeah, I just I don't agree with how people shop or buy parts these days. It it should be very goal driven. Like if you're gonna make, was, my my buddy Chase Fleece the other day is like, you know, we could make a shitload more power. We could make four thousand horsepower. Just takes more air. It's just by the time we get there, we're spending so many RPM that we don't have enough, you know, airflow downstairs to get it to even light. And that's something that guys don't understand is, you know, horsepower and torque. If you're going to make a thousand horsepower by a thousand RPM, that's a really big cubic inch engine that can do that because the torque load is going to be so, it's going to make a, tr a, just a lot of torque. Now, Cummins six sevens make a lot better torque than a five nine, better better you know better stroke, and stroke makes power. They've got bigger bore. They shroud the air better. You can flow more air through them, but a six seven will bend a set of connecting rods into little bananas at six hundred fifty horsepower. And a five nine, I've never seen a six hundred fifty horsepower five nine come close to bending a rod. So that's you really got to have a goal and then go with somebody you trust to to help you get the right parts and back to your original smaller injectors better sorry <laughs> i was thinking of connecting a bunch of different topics it's probably a big question i just thought of it <clears throat> on the fly but we talked earlier about smoke and gosh going back to 2019 2020 you've talked with me about smoky trucks and the perception of it. And then now we're talking about setting power goals. You work with tons of shops all over North America, probably even the world, but specifically say in the U S have you seen the mindset changed at the shop level where they're trying to deliver something for their customers? So they're hearing, I want a thousand horsepower daily driver that I can tow. Lenny, what do you got for me? Has that changed on there in a bit where they're saying, I want to give them the power, but I don't want the smoke show thing. So how do I combine all this? I'm really curious on that professional side, what you're seeing. Uh, you know, on the professional side, I've almost, I'm almost frustrated with a lot of shop owners because I call somebody and go, hey, man, what happened? You kind of fell off the mat. And they're like, oh, man, we just, you know, with all the 
you know, the, with the, the elite crackdown, we just got completely out of performance. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I've told you guys for a long time, don't do that. It's illegal. We all know that's legal. That will be a really short, and I hope it's a profitable ride for you guys because everybody knew that was illegal. That was that was not a good business model to try and follow and and set up your college uh, fund for your you know your children. But now, like we've spent so much time building injectors that aren't smoky and don't kill engines with stock calibration files. Hi, I'm your answer. Like <laughs> we have all the parts available to do things legally and not make them smoky or offensive. And still, when your customer comes in with 125 or 150,000 miles, needs a set of injectors, you're charging them the same amount of labor to run down to O'Reilly's and buy somebody's whatever part as you would be if you bought a set from us. That's a, a fun to drive, snappy improvement, um, gets around better. You don't need our, our street driver stuff is just, it's not abusive at all. And it's not going to smoke unless you stack it with somebody else's horrible calibration. So the shop owner's mindsets have definitely, they they used to be like on the far of being like way too aggressive, in my opinion. Like, we're just going to delete the planet kind of a thing. And, you know, I mean, the first time I ever got on this podcast to you, I told people, I'm like, better rethink it. Because there's a day coming and it's pretty soon when people start getting cracked down like that's that's a reckless way to run your your show and look what happened a lot of people got cracked down but now so many people are so scared of it which i'm kind of glad but i do think that the epa has gone about that the wrong way i think that i think that instead of attacking shop owners or parts manufacturers cuz most of the parts manufacturers or the tuning manufacturers are doing something not to be offensive but when the consumer gets reckless, carried away, purchases ignorant things to stack on top of things, that's something that a consumer should be, they should be given the citations. And I guarantee that if, you know, there was smoke police that drove around looking, at, you know, looking for those trucks and you got it to where those guys couldn't even get registrations, um, that would be, that would be the key to end it, right? Like that, and that would generate good money because at that level, you're uh, you're eliminating the the problem childs anyway. So brakes, ball joints, those things pay the bills, and they're absolutely needed to keep trucks on the road. But they're not. Uh, you don't have to just stay on brakes and ball joints now. You can do stuff to give your customers an entertaining, fun truck to drive. And you know the biggest pride that I have in any of my stuff is even if it's like our 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 uh, stock series stuff, we calibrate that right at the very top of the stock uh, profiles. So whatever, you know, the OEM of whichever application recommends, we calibrate that to the top, the very, very top of a factory plan. So when you buy a set of our, our uh, Patriots compared to something you'd buy from anybody else who's kind of calibrated in this big window, our stuff's more fun to drive. It yeah. starts better, it runs better, it gets better mileage. Uh, it's just a better balanced set of injectors. So, man, we've we've already spent, it's 2024. I've got nine years invested of my life working on injection that is DPF SCR friendly. We still have alternatives right now that you can bolt in a factory power stroke or a factory, you know, whatever Cummins and they're just fun to drive. So your customer, it's not going to make a hundred horsepower doesn't need to, but everything about drivability is way sharper, way cleaner, starts easier. It's just more fun to drive. I think having those options there is so, so huge. I think back to a truck I had and I wasn't, I didn't work in diesel. <clears throat> I was barely into it. And I had an issue with uh, a CP3 and I went to a local diesel shop and the guy's like, I can put a stock one on for you, but here's this other alternative has a little bit more volume. Price is pretty close. If you want to do things in the future, this will support whatever you might want to do. I went with that. Not that I needed it, but I went with it. Yeah. And then that started to stack with other things. I noticed 
little bit more throttle response. And then as I did something with tuning, it was more responsive. And that started a whole process, not where I was looking to make a bunch of power, but I was happy as a customer mm -hmm. because I had my problem solved and I got a little bit of enjoyment out of it. And I think you're, you're right. Cause I've seen it so many places where shops have said, okay, I see what's going on. I see these enforcement activities all over the country. I'm just going to do maintenance. But human nature, I think, as a truck owner, especially a truck enthusiast, you want a little bit more. You want a little bit more response, a little lower EGTs, maybe a little bit more on the top and a little bit more torque down low. And that's not going to go away. That's just human nature that we want it. So I think it's really cool to see like the fueling products we're talking about, being able to deliver that and still do it in a clean, efficient way. Have you ever seen that little meme? that shows like the very first uh, internal combustion engine car coming off the, uh, the assembly line and the dude just drives away. No big deal. Right. Like he's just happier than shit to drive truck or his car. <laughs> and then they say that the, uh, the second car rolls off the assembly line the second day. And that day was the very first automobile race. <laughs> it is human nature. Like yeah. we, as humans, we always want just a little bit more. And, you know, I've got a client who's got uh, semi trucks, about 20 uh, pack car, 13 liter semi trucks. And I told him this has been three, four, five years ago now. Hey, look, I'd, I'd really like to look at a set of those injectors. I never have. But next time you get one in just for, you know, a, a cylinder head gaskets or whatever, I'd like to see the injectors. OK, so we ran them. And of course, we didn't have tools to run them. So we had to get those. And then we ran them and we just did our, our best to balance them. Uh, in the test stand and bear in mind, I've never driven, you know, one of those 13 liter motors and he put them in. He says, man, I, I tell you what, it actually runs quite a bit smoother than it used to. I said, all right, cool. So his name's Rick. And since then, Rick's been, whenever they pull a truck in and tear it down, they, they let us go through and balance them up and, you know, kind of clean things up for them. So same set of injectors that we got a bit more aggressive with like did a little bit of AFM work in the nozzle, made sure they were perfect. Got the bodies balanced out. Perfect. And I called them and I said, man, you got that truck running? Yeah. Yeah. But now it's, you know, it's doing this. So we think it's the ECM. And I was like, nah, I don't think it's the ECM buddy. Like he would, he would get it out and it would stall itself out. And if you let it sit long enough, it would fire right up and run perfectly until he loaded again. I says, I think you need to look for a fuel pressure drop or restriction on the inlet side going to the injection system. Sure enough, they found there was a problem there. They took care of that. Uh, and this is after Pat Carr recommended they put an ECM in it, right? So he gets struck on the road and running. I call him up and say, man, how's that thing run? You know, well, Lenny, I don't really want to, I don't really want to tell you what I know yet because it's only been a month and I've only got one fuel, you know, one month of fuel. each truck is numbered. He's like, and I only got one set of fuel bills hill for one month, and it looks way too optimistic to be true. So I'm going to hold off on giving you any information. All right, cool. So I see him a month later. Hey, how's it going? He's like, two months of running data, and it looks pretty good. On the third month, I figured he probably wasn't going to get back to me. He called me and said, hey, month one was way too optimistic. Month two was just as optimistic. And now that the bills are in for the third month, this is Christmas to Rick. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, DEF consumption definitely dropped. But more importantly, I've already done the math. This is a $9,500 savings to me this year on the one truck. So I've said that for how long? Like if each hole goes bang, bang, bang equally, then not one of those holes is basically fighting parasitic drag for the weakest hole in the engine. And because of that, because we're getting engines that run very, very evenly, they're going to be the most efficient. And that's something like when I go to this university, that's the part that I want to stress to them, because those are the guys with the microphone that people are going to listen to on the top top, because I do believe that diesel injection is the key to our successful future when it comes to all emissions. It's not electric. That's bullshit. But a properly tuned diesel engine, air fuel ratio is the most effective effective way to, to basically propel the planet. 
And I get that people think that dirty old diesel is gross. And that's true. Like a low injection system, low pressure injection that was made 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago was dirty. But we now have such high pressure. We now have tools to make spray orifices and to make control valves. We've got grinders that measure things in microns. So you don't need gaskets to seal stuff up. You, you make it with the proper clearance. And things hold pressure inside the injector body way better. And that's that's the blessing to where we're at right now. If And I get that if you make 10,000 or something every day, there's got to be a fairly large target to hit. But, buddy, when, you know, it's been cold. How cold has it gotten in Denver lately? Gosh, it was like minus 10 for three or four days. That sucked. And then it warmed up a little bit. And now it's cold again. So... If it was minus 22 at my house like a week ago, and at minus 22, when you own any electric vehicle and you don't have an internal combustion engine generating heat, the moment that you drive away in your EV, you're trying to use your battery to propel you from point A to point B. But you're also having to use some form of heat generation to keep you from freezing to death. Right yep. now you stop in an internal combustion engine. And as long as the engine stays running, it's still generating its own heat. So the guy driving the vehicle isn't freezing even at idle. When you stop in a EV, you're still using the same amount of Watts to keep you from freezing at the cab. So you lose a lot of miles per gallon per se, because you're having to stay warm in the car, right? It doesn't make a lot of sense in a very cold climate that you see a lot of EVs. I, I think EVs have their place. It's in a small community or, or a large city where people have short drives. That's where EVs have a lot of success. But you're not, I don't think you'll ever see EVs taking over. An EV in Seattle, Washington, where when it gets to 12 degrees you know, above, it's cold there. And it doesn't do that very often. I don't think you'll ever see EVs as popular in New York City, where it's got a lot better chance of being a lot colder for a lot longer. They're just not going to go as far. Even if you just are an Uber driver, when you're having to pull over and spend, now you're sitting in your vehicle, you've got the little pigtail plugged into your car. And instead of freezing to death while you read your book and 15 minutes later you drive away, you're running your heater to try and stay warm while you've got the thing plugged in. So you're constantly using the energy that you've got plugged into the car. Now, meanwhile, you know, like most of the electric that we generate in America is coal fired anyway. So even though you think you're doing something really clean, cause it's not coming out your tailpipe somewhere else, you're burning another fuel. So I, I just, you see the thing about Hertz lately? I saw something with their, was it their Teslas where they were selling off a bunch of the, all fleet. EVs, not just Teslas, but all electric vehicles. So at one point in time, you know, recently they were saying by 2024, uh, all of their rental cars were going to be, uh, uh, not, excuse me, not all. Uh, they said that 25% of their rental fleet would be EV powered by 2024. We just entered 2024. And because of the cost to repair the vehicles, they see no point in keeping them. So they're they're doing a fire sale on EVs. So I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like that's that's a very that was a very ambitious plan back then to become, you know, globally green. And that's what everybody told them was the the key. But if Hertz, who owns a lot more cars than you or I and all of our friends put together, if they've already seen math point them in the direction of like that ain't the way to go. You, the guy that owns a car that drives around, just like I said, you know, Seattle, Portland, bigger communities, you know, you've got lots of spots to plug in and charge up and the climate's very mild, then that probably pencils for you. That's probably a good deal. But when you're the governor of Washington or California saying everybody's going to have an electric car and then Spokane, Washington's minus 12, you won't have enough electricity to keep those cars the daily drivers, if you think that it's tough to buy 
commodity projects right now, like beef, eggs, things like that. We put that kind of restraint on the electric grid. It's going to be really cold days sitting at home wishing you had beef and eggs in the fridge. It's just, it's too much load. And sure, it may work great when it's like 65, 75, 80 degrees. Grid may hold up. But then Mother Nature comes out and goes, what's up? Let's party. <laughs> it's a totally different party. I think that's been the frustrating part with it because I'm all I'm all for choice. If somebody wants to drive an EV, <clears throat> I think they should have the choice to do it. If they want to drive a gas vehicle, they should have a choice to do it. If they want to drive a diesel, they should have the choice to do it. But it feels like collectively or in society, it was just a push to go all EV and do it right now. We're going to get you EV trucks, EV cars, EV semis, and... Like you mentioned with the snow, I saw something with, I don't know what place it was. It was really cold and they had a bunch of EVs that couldn't get charged. There was like a waiting line for it. And I think that's bringing it back to the diesel side. I think that's where we're talking about with this P pump, what you've talked about with injectors with us, what you've talked about with the performance side is showing it's viable, showing it can operate within these different frameworks that have changed over the years with emission standards. Now that's one of the big things I see a lot is people think if it's pre-07, there's no emission standards. They think if it's pre-03, there's no emission standards. There were, they were just a lot different than they are when we think about them now. So I think it's really exciting. And I think being able to deliver, that was why I asked the question about the shop owners and and, and how they, some of them just look at, well, I'm just going to do maintenance now and, and that's it. You're delivering something to them where they can deliver a quality product to their customer and that customer can walk away and you get that smile. Because once you get that smile, you think, okay, this is cool. What else do I want to do? Um, and it, it all is just this big kind of cycle, and it all feeds off of each other. It, it, Yeah. So Magnaflow makes high-performance, high-flow catalytic converters, and they make a four-inch ID converter, right? I've tested that thing to 700 horsepower on the hub dyno. And it had less than a pound of back pressure. That is a, and what's cool about a catalytic converter that not everyone realize is when you start a truck with no cat, no DPF, no nothing on it, and it's idling, you smell the stinky diesel smell, right? Like the kind of, it's just, it's not the most pleasant thing to smell. But let's say you live in an apartment complex or you live in a a neighborhood where everybody kind of has a very small yard. Now, first off, it's very, very noisy when you fire up that truck and your neighbor is trying to figure out like how they can pour a bottle of seven up in your fuel tank to shut your truck off. Seven ups full of sugar, sugar shuts down diesel. So it's just an idea. That being said, if you put a cat back on that truck and a muffler, you're not losing any power, any performance whatsoever because exhaust gas companies have come a long way. And now we've got parts that will support probably more horsepower then you have enough turbocharger or fuel to really feed. So I've really enjoyed putting those Magnaflow four inch cats on all my vehicles. Cause now when I start them, they don't have that rancid diesel smell. And honestly, like the older I get, you know, now I'm 50. I don't, I don't want to hear all of it. I don't, you know, when I put my dogs and my missus in the car, I want to be able to drive down the road and have a conversation. And, you know, it's noisy when your dog, can't speak to you, but they put their paws on their ears. <laughs> That's too far, too gone. Like it's, it's too much. Yeah. So I really, not just dynamite. Like I think that what we've done in the past nine years, I guess has, I've realized that we've just been really bad at marketing. We haven't told people about the stuff we do. We've just done it and been like, we know it runs better than the other guy's stuff. So you guys will buy it and you'll tell your friends. And now I'm realizing like pile hole technology, if I didn't tell you about it, you wouldn't know we did it. But I told people about it and people are like, what? That's really cool. I'm actually going to step up. And then people are like, well, does it really work? Does it really work? And everybody's going, yes, it really works. That's simple. Like I went up front and told the sales guys are frustrated because we get on podcasts and we talk about things and I don't even tell the sales guys about it because I just assume like they're learning through osmosis kind of a thing, right? Like they're they're in the same building, so they must know the same. And they're like, what the hell is this P-pump timing thing? And he's kind of angry. And I'm like, hold on, like, quit being like that. Let's talk about it. You're right. We don't have enough sales meetings. So we don't in the injector shop 
in the production area where Mitch is out installing the motor, we're not letting you guys know about all the things we're learning. So this is a Lenny problem. Like this is a fault by Lenny that Lenny needs to fix. So yeah, we're, I mean, this week, um, <laughs> um, Hart's Diesel called up and well, shot me a message. Him and I share Brandon Hart and I share customers that are same people. And he, I just met him this week, but what a great guy. And uh, super entertaining to speak to because he's a really sharp dude. He understands a lot about internal combustion engines. He got into common rail fuel injection about three years ago. And as soon as I heard it, I thought that dude's busy. Like he has to be way too busy for that. And he's making huge injection pumps and huge turbos. His client base isn't the common rail guy, but you know, everybody's got their own, you know, drum to, to, to dance to. He decided because he hasn't fired up his common rail stuff in a long time that it was time to get rid of it. So he, he gave me a call and said, Hey, you know, I got this gear and he told me what he had. And I was like, you don't have that. Like there's not one of those in the United States right now. So he's like, no, 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 I do. I said, well, you can send me a picture of it. That'd be great. Cause I'm thinking he's got just a Bosch 815 like everybody else. And uh, he doesn't have a Bosch 815. So he bought a Bosch out of Germany that uh, super cool tool, because when you hit go, the cycle time is like say 12 minutes which basically most of our test stands is 12 minutes to complete all five test steps. But all the rest of us on the planet can only test one injector basically every 12 minutes unless you edit short and shorten the test plans. Well, the one that he bought cycles four light truck injectors and six automotive injectors during that 12 minutes. So it's actually got individual counters in it. So when you hit go, all of a sudden you got six injectors showing what they're flowing in quantity. And we're buying that. Like, I'm going to ADS this coming week, and probably the week after, I'm going to drive down to Missouri, probably rent like a rider truck or a U-Haul, throw it in the truck, strap it down. Then I got to swing by a buddy's place, and I got to purchase or uh, pick up my engine that's been sitting there, and then continue my long journey home <laughs> in a rider truck. <laughs> so that's really cool because now we're going to have a genuine piece of equipment that's got all of the data plans in it from the genuine OEM. And uh, it's something that, again, nobody in the States has. So that's going to help my, the remanufacturing side of things, where on the one line stand that we're out there testing those things on, we're able to do about 40-ish per day. This is going to pretty much add 300% quantity to that. So one operator will be able to calibrate or test anyways, 120 injectors on the same time stamp that's yeah. a big difference it's a big difference oh yeah well it was i appreciate you chatting with me today lenny and uh <clears throat> dropping a ton of knowledge as uh as you always do i'm excited i'm always excited to chat with you but then see see how you're pushing things so it was uh great to catch up with you i know you got some busy stuff coming up the next couple of weeks keep me updated on it all right man i appreciate you thank you very much and you know to all your listeners like guys guys enjoy your trucks have a lot of fun and and uh, don't be afraid to try some new technology because this stuff drives way better than it used to. Don't forget, diesel fans, make sure and head on over to Kershaw.kaiusa.com. Use code 2024-DIESEL40 for 40% off MSRP. Great way to save some money, get some really cool gear. If you need a knife for hunting, fishing, EDC around the job site, around the house, they've definitely got you covered with a bunch of different choices for blade steel, blade shape, handle design, and they've got a whole lineup designed to meet any budget. So if you're in the market, head on over to their website and use code 2024-DIESEL40 for 40% off MSRP. Also want to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters, Tyler Lowen at 23 Diesel, John, J. Cole, all of our other Patreon supporters, all of you who subscribe on YouTube podcast apps, follow us on social media. We appreciate your support here in your eight of the Diesel podcast and look forward to bringing you more of the content that you want to hear in 2024. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.